900, Jason Heiner. 900 is our magic number today. That is the dollar cost per month of using social media while at work. That's a lot of money. So social media can cost us time, energy, there's trolls, there's all kinds of negative stuff, but it's not all bad. In fact, social media has brought us a lot of good. Jason, you and I met on social, but I have no idea when or where. Uh, this must have been over a decade ago. Yeah, so Dan, you and I met on social around 2007, and we were on so many of the same platforms uh, and we're friends on so many of the same platforms that eventually I, I think we've forgotten where we originally met or how we became friends, but, but our friendship eventually transcended social media. And then in 2015, I uh, posted on Facebook that I had this opening at Tech Republic. You decided to uh, reach out to me. I remember you, you messaged me on Facebook Messenger, was like, hey, you know, tell me a little bit more about this. And eventually you became uh, part of the team at Tech Republic and at CBS Interactive. And, uh, and then over the years, uh, we've interacted on social less and less and more real world, more and more. And the interesting thing is a lot of our friends uh, and colleagues in the industry who've been on social media on some of these uh, early platforms from the very beginning, from Twitter to Facebook to Foursquare when it was big to Instagram and all of these platforms, they've experienced uh, a lot of the same kind of thing. Uh, and that they initially were friends and met on social, but uh, now they're doing less on social and a lot of their friends that they met there are more friends in the real world and they barely interact on social. So I'm kind of wondering, you know, what do you think, you know, why is that and how has that come about? You know, yeah, so Jason, I, I always tell people that the next big app is maybe no app. Uh, you know, we see this emerging trend with Apple uh, and the next iOS will talk about a smartphone addiction. And, you know, we have all of this news about did Facebook throw the election and Twitter trolls are everywhere. And social media's branding has kind of gone from being this utility function where uh, we can develop relationships, just like you and I develop relationships that are professional but also personal into this weird space where there is a lot of value, but there might also just be a window of value. You know, the, the time you spend on social might go through the excitement and new rush, just like a relationship, and you get those dopamine pings of, of notifications and replies to, okay, it's a tool, I have to use it, to, okay, it's a tool and I have to use it, but I feel a little bit like a tool using it. Uh, so w we've gone through this weird arc of social and the question that kind of lingers for me is, well, what's the value? And that's why I come back to this number of $900 per month, at least in terms of time lost, if you're checking your phone at work, to, well, okay, we, we may need social in order to have a better conversation with people and, and in order to better understand our neighbors. Jason, what, what is the next phase? Yeah, it is. It's really fascinating to think about where it's going, right? Because I, I just did a story um, this week. I was the, it was the 10th anniversary of Apple launching the iPhone, right? And I did a story, the 10 most important uh, apps of all time on the iPhone. Uh, and the, the big conclusion, I won't give away too much of it. You can go over, it's on our sister site, uh, download.com. Uh, the reason that this, uh, this has been really interesting in the context of this conversation is that the killer app clearly on the iPhone uh, has been social media. Um, the most downloaded app of all time has been Facebook. Uh, but the place that people spend so many, so much of their time uh, is on all of these social media apps, whether it's Twitter, whether it's Instagram, whether it's Snapchat, um, and, and many others. Some that have come and gone, like I mentioned uh, Foursquare, which is still around, but uh, uh, there have been others uh, as well. So what does that mean as we sort of have gotten to this point where social media has now, in some sense, kind of turned against us a little bit, right? People are realizing in some cases they spend too much time. Um, one, they're investing too much emotional value in it, uh, which is why you've seen a number of people uh, very clearly state that uh, they've had a much better uh, week, they've had a much better time since they stopped using uh, some of these, Facebook uh, or some of the others. 
Um, and it's brought out the best and the worst of people, which is to be expected because it, it's sort of a mirror of society. And so what, what we have to ask is we see, you know, this story that you and I have talked about. You know, you and I have both gotten to the point where we've started limiting our time on social media uh, purposefully. We've also started uh, limiting the amount of platforms that we're interacting on because it does become uh, a chore, you know, and a job. People, uh, experts talk about that the reason why social media is so popular is people get these dopamine hits, right, from a like, um, a retweet, uh, um, a view. And, uh, but if you've been doing social media the way that we have, uh, where it's also part of our job as, as journalists in our case, uh, it eventually moves from being something that is a joy to something that is work and something that is a bit of a chore and really is becomes a bit of a burden. So you have to wonder at what point, you know, the, the mass of people start to get the, the same effect, right? Because it's been about five years since uh, a lot of these have gone mainstream. And so a lot of people that are uh, in social media, the, the majority of people that are in social media uh, are kind of in, still a little bit in the honeymoon phase or they're at least in the phase where they're pretty good at it and they're enjoying it a lot. But I think the question to ask is, will I get to the point that you and I have gotten, Dan, where now it's, it's less of a joy and it's a lot more of a burden? I mean, so my, my question for you is, you know, maybe you could mention a little bit, you know, what platforms do you spend your time on and which ones have you, you know, cut out entirely? Uh, and, and how did you decide to do that? The democratization of the dissemination of information was the talking point hook I used to use everywhere with everyone okay. all the time. I, I was on Twitter in the beta because of Odeo, and I lived in South Dakota. For me at the time, social media was revolutionary because I could connect with people without an arbiter in the middle. And this was long before the age of algorithms determining what shows up in your feed. In fact, this lasted so long that a, a recent narrative was, oh, Facebook's fine, but they can't figure out mobile. This was through yeah. 2010 when they purchased Instagram for $1.1 billion. And of course the company has diversified a ton, right? Instagram, WhatsApp, Oculus with the VR, Facebook is a diversified platform now. And the rest of social media is just as diversified as Facebook was and, and as social media has, uh, kind of a nuanced space now. But Jason, I, I stopped using almost every social media platform uh, about a year ago for a reason. Uh, and that reason was deeply personal. Uh, it it yeah. cost me too much. It was taxing my intellect, it was taxing my time, and it was taxing my emotions, particularly Facebook. And, and I'm saying this as, as a personal decision, but one that's loaded with anecdotal data. Uh, Facebook in particular, because of the way the algorithm is designed, and the jargon in the space is, is coercive design, but what that really means is that the platform is designed to suck up more and more of your time and to put content in front of you that you'll react to emotionally and quickly. And I found that I was having kind of an emotional reaction. I don't mean a heated flip out, I wasn't crying, I wasn't angry, but every time I'd log into Facebook, I'd kind of feel a little bad. And then I thought about that magic number that I opened up with, which was, I got stuff to do. And, and so many people have just stuff to do. What am I doing with this endless scrolling? This isn't adding a lot of value back to my life. In fact, it's kind of taking a lot of value from me. The same with Instagram, the same with WhatsApp, and the same with almost every algorithmic network. And so I just looked at, what am I doing? Oh my goodness, I'm on every single platform. I am way too exposed on these networks. So I just systematically spent a couple hours a week first deleting Facebook, and I figured I'll reinvest this time that I put into Facebook back into deleting or deactivating networks that are unnecessary for my life. And, and then I put more time into exercise, more time outdoors, more time into reading books, and I realized I feel a lot better about the way I use the internet. So 
To answer your question, Jason, I, I still find social media incredibly valuable. And I, I find the networks that, that I get value out of are tied to my job. And this is different for almost everyone, but uh, I use Twitter and I use LinkedIn because those are places where, well, on LinkedIn, people are a little better behaved. And on Twitter, I can reach people and I can chatter with people without although this is changing, without an algorithm really dictating what I see and, and the time that I, I spend on the network. I spend less time scrolling, I post, I interact, and then I get back to my life and job. And I, I know, Jason, that's a little bit of a long-winded story, but I bet almost everyone has a similar long-winded story and they probably have <laughs> feelings that are unarticulated about how and why they're using social media. Yeah, it's true. And for me, Dan, my, my story's actually been pretty similar. Uh, Facebook was the one that I found that I, I was going to and not feeling very good about what I was seeing or how I was feeling afterwards. And for me, a lot of it was tied to the fact that there's a lot of people that I really like. And when I see the things they post on Facebook, a lot of this was tied to around the 2016 election when people were really heated um, or really sort of some of the worst was coming out in people. Uh, and there were a lot of people uh, on both sides of the political spectrum that I really liked, and I was seeing them post things that made me not like them very well. Uh, and I was like, I really don't want to feel badly about people that, uh, that I really like and respect. And that was one of the first things that made me stop going to Facebook. Uh, and then over time, uh, I had a similar experience to you where when I, when I was not on social media and I'd spend the time taking a walk, you know, reading, catching up on um, things with friends or family, giving somebody a phone call, um, I, I felt a lot better. I felt less connected, uh, but I felt more, um, I felt better about the people that I was connected to. And so that made me think, rethink kind of how I was approaching social media as well. And, you know, my approach is similar, but slightly different than yours. You know, Facebook, uh, I, I went to uh, n almost uh, not at all. Uh, Twitter, I used as essentially a news feed. Uh, I go there. Uh, I, I'm only connected to, to people that uh, share mostly news. Um, or if they, they share other stuff, sometimes I'll, I'll turn off retweets. Sometimes I mute people if it's people that don't necessarily um, share a lot of news value, things of news value. Uh, so I do like their mute feature. That helps a lot. And then I love photography. I love taking photos. So I, I am still on Instagram. Um, I'm there kind of, I, I go in spurts where, you know, I, I'm traveling somewhere. I'll post a bunch of photos and I'll look at a bunch of photos from other people. I kind of will have the time when I'm traveling to actually spend more time on something like Instagram. Um, and then to your point, too, for professional reasons, LinkedIn has actually turned into a much more valuable network for me where I, I sometimes will post uh, either stories that we're working on, which relate to people of business, uh, you know, stories from Tech Republic or, or ZDNet especially. Um, but I'm also uh, using LinkedIn as a way to to be very purposeful, purposeful in my professional life, you know, connect to people that I care about, um, see who wants to connect to me or has an idea they want to share, uh, those kinds of things. So, uh, so I've limited it uh, in similar ways, uh, but I'd say, interestingly enough, I'm maybe a little bit, I, I think of myself as not being very connected uh, to social media anymore, certainly not nearly as much as I was five years or 10 years ago. Um, but I'm more connected than you are. You've gone uh, even further than I have. W what do you think, in terms of some of the other people, some of our other friends and colleagues that uh, you know, you and I know a lot of people uh, who've been around since the beginning, uh, what kind of other stories have you heard from, from people that we know uh, or, or that you know that are uh, experiencing you know, similar things? Well, there is certainly uh, anecdotal evidence to back a lot of this up. Uh, I, I don't know if there's data, but maybe we will have some data. Look, uh, everyone feels the sense of social media exhaustion. 
Um, most of my friends have experienced some sort of trolling, uh, and, and certainly the women in my social graphs have experienced trolling to the degree to which they either just quit Twitter, they quit Facebook, uh, or they, they lock their accounts down. Uh, now we see Twitter and Facebook take trolling and take behavior on the networks more seriously now, uh, but maybe some context is important here. Uh, you remember the early, early days of Twitter, it was kind of the free speech wing of the free speech party, and there really was this idealism associated with uh, Silicon Valley that may not be present anymore, but really, social was supposed to be the thing that democratized conversation, and many of us were simply naive and didn't see a lot of the trolling or the, the potential political outcomes coming. We may have been naive about that. Where I really see value is not so much in the let's kill social or get away from social, but it is in these lockdown networks. And I think that's one of the power of powers of technology. Technology does provide for the democratization of the dissemination of information, but it's happening in different ways. One great example is a Slack group that we've had running, my very close group of friends, since 2014. And in this Slack group, we can have nuanced conversations. We have a diverse group. We have a gender diverse, we have an ethnically diverse group of friends, and we have a politically diverse group of friends. And we're able to have nuanced conversation. One, because the stakes are higher. We know that our friendship is on the line in a way that is not a bragging, boastful, more public way. We have to have a conversation in order to figure out issues. I would bet that there are tons of people with similar stories. We also see the rise of networks like Discord. We see the rise of networks like Reddit. Now, of course, Reddit is a haven for trolls and the gaming industry has had a contentious relationship with trolls, but those are communities based on not necessarily who you are and your ability to brag or be boastful in public, but do the opposite. Communicate anonymously or pseudo-anonymously to smaller groups of people who have mutual interests. And I think that that might be the trend going forward. Yeah, I've had a similar experience with smaller um, groups of trusted people communicating with them. Uh, the key that you mentioned is trying to find some diversity in that uh, and so that it does not become an echo chamber. Um, that is the biggest drawback that we've learned from social media is echo chambers uh, are enabled by this type of free speech that we now have uh, on the internet. And that has been a very negative thing. Clearly, many people uh, have come to see the world through the filter of these very narrow, uh, very um, echoey versions of the internet and of community that they get. Uh, they get reinforced in views that uh, oftentimes are, are divisive uh, or even um, in some cases violent, right? And so this is one of the things that uh, has been a negative effect uh, of these platforms that really we didn't fully anticipate. I say fully because I remember, and I'm sure you do as well, Dan, uh, there were lots of people that were talking about bubbles uh, since all of these platforms started. Uh, I, I think that we didn't completely take them seriously or think about what they would mean once you know, all of humanity or you know, at least a, billions of people were on these platforms. Because now that they're there, uh, ideas uh, in terms of racism, misogyny, uh, you know, anti-immigrant ideas, all of these things that people find ways to find other people that reinforce those ideas that, that seem to accept them as perfectly rational uh, in, in ways that if they had a larger group, uh, they would not be. Uh, that social media has enabled this kind of behavior and this has been the biggest negative factor uh, in social media. And we've seen it play a larger and larger part in uh, public dialogue and how public dialogue has become so bifurcated, so divisive. Uh, and there haven't been as many really um, positive conversations where people of extremes 
uh, or people even of different viewpoints end up coming together, having dialogue, and naturally moderating some of their uh, perspectives by getting those perspectives of other people. And this is the biggest challenge that we have going forward. I think that as we look at where social media is headed and where uh, the internet and, and public dialogue and free speech um, are all going, these are the things that we have to find ways to overcome. And there are some people that are very thoughtfully, very purposefully trying to overcome it in the ways that you mentioned is, is a good one, Dan, where you're seeking out groups of people to create a private dialogue uh, among a diverse set of people where you have some trust, where you can create uh, some opportunities to talk about issues where you know that you have very different perspectives, and then it gives you the chance to either moderate your views, um, in some cases argue out some of these ideas, uh, and, and then figure out where uh, you know which ideas have the most merit, or in some cases it may change your mind. Like I said, it may moderate it, or in some cases it'll reinforce it right by by understanding other viewpoints. But but that's such an important thing for us as a society to have, and it's the biggest thing that's missing in today's uh, uh, environment online and today's social media. What is the value? Uh, you may be watching this or listening to this and say $900 a month. I don't make $900 a month, let alone have that to lose in one hour per workday. And look, I based that figure on a $45 an hour entry level and mid-level developer position. And we talk about that because developers are those who are creating these social networks. Um, but the question remains for almost everyone. And I bet that people will nod along with a lot of these stories and we can keep the dialogue going. What is the value? And, and it's nuanced. The answer is nuanced because clearly, as we've discussed here, the, there is tremendous value to social media and social networks. And these networks aren't static. They do evolve and they evolve with us, but they're also ripe for exploitation and they're ripe for emotional and, and uh, intellectual exploitation. Uh, and it may be just incumbent upon all of us to kind of figure out uh, what am I getting out of this? What types of conversations am I having here? And, and where can I put my energy? And, and maybe that is on social media. Maybe it's splitting the time I spend on social or just being more thoughtful about it. But Jason, I wonder if we could kind of close with another rhetorical question, and, and that is, uh, the, the looming story of smartphone addiction. We know that Apple is releasing in the next version of iOS um, tools that will allow you to monitor your social media usage. Now, Apple's answer to the rhetorical question, what is the value? And Facebook's answer, Twitter's answer is multiples of billions of dollars. These questions that we have here are, are great for us to consider as human beings. As corporations, uh, these technology companies have profited tremendously in the last decade from our use of smartphones and social media. So Jason, uh, take us out, help us understand smartphones and their role in the growth of social over the next phase, the next era. Uh, is, this, is this a made up problem? Or is this something that every device manufacturer, every tech company will simply have to contend with? Yes, every company, every app maker, every hardware maker, um, every part of the mobile ecosystem, um, web apps, all of these things are gonna have to think about this issue of optimizing people's time. Uh, despite the um, the, the calls to get rid of or stop using these things. I saw at a conference recently uh, how many people were um, attracted to at Mobile World Congress in Barcelona, how many people were attracted to a flip phone that had a battery life of a week. They're like, I really want to go take one of these things when I go on vacation so I don't even have to be bothered you know, when I'm on vacation. Um, it speaks to the fact that uh, there is this, this thirst to get back to optimizing our time. All of the vendors are gonna have to think about this. All of them are thinking about 
helping people not um, waste their time, but get at the things that have the most value to them. And that, in, in truth, that's where this, alg this idea of the algorithm came about, right, is to optimize people's time. Uh, but obviously it has ways that it can run amok, as it did um, during the election, during the battle over fake news, um, during times when people have manipulated this algorithm to get something in front of people to get emotional reactions and to essentially manipulate them um, in, in some very unpleasant ways. What we need is all of these companies to, to think about this idea of helping people optimize in their time, giving them the things that, um, and surfacing the things that, that provide them the most value and giving them the option to opt into some of those things have some transparency around seeing um, you know, how they are being optimized by the platform and then have the opportunity to have a say uh, in that as well. That's where we're getting to, right? It's great to have um, Facebook, uh, it, the initial idea was good. It was great that Facebook would just surface you the most relevant things. The next stage is people seeing what Facebook thinks you want to see seeing that list, understanding the algorithm, and then being able to manipulate it themselves. Uh, and the same will be true of the way that the phone uh, will surface and uh, filter things for you, as well as any algorithm, any app, um, any bit of machine learning that's trying to understand you and in one sense also has the power to manipulate you. Um, you being able to have some transparency and some visibility into that and being able to have a say, that's the next stage.